In 1899, there were four academic public high schools in Washington, D.C., one black and three white. In standardized tests given that year, students in the black high school averaged higher test scores than students in two of the three white high schools. Today, more than a century later, it would be considered utopian even to set that as a goal, much less expect it to actually happen. Yet what happened back in 1899 was no isolated fluke. That same school repeatedly equaled or exceeded national norms on standardized tests in the 1930s, 1940s, and early 1950s. Back in the 1890s, it was called the M Street School, and in 1916, it was renamed Dunbar High School. When this information on Dunbar High School was first published in the 1970s, those few educators who responded at all dismissed the relevance of these findings by saying that these were middle-class children, and therefore their experience was not relevant to the education of low-income minority children. Those who said this had no factual data on the incomes or occupations of the parents of these children, and the data that existed said just the opposite. The problem, however, was not that these dismissive educators did not have evidence. The more fundamental problem was that they saw no need for evidence. According to their doctrines, children who did well on standardized tests were middle class. These children did well on such tests, so therefore they must be middle class. It so happens that there was evidence on the occupations of the parents of the children at this school as far back as the early 1890s. As of academic year 1892-93, of the known occupations of these parents, there were 51 laborers, 25 messengers, 12 janitors, and one doctor. That hardly seems middle class. Over the years, a significant black middle class did develop in Washington, and most of them may well have sent their children to the M Street School, or to Dunbar High School, as it was later called. But that is wholly different from saying that most of the children at that school came from middle-class homes. More detailed data on parental occupations are available for a later period, from the late 1930s through the mid-1950s. These data reveal that there were far more children whose mothers were maids than there were whose fathers were doctors. Mary Gibson Hundley, who taught at Dunbar for many years, wrote, a large segment of the homes of the students had one or more government employees for support. Before the 1940s, these employees were messengers and clerks, with few exceptions. It is possible, of course, to redefine middle class in relative terms for the black community as it existed at that time, but such verbal dexterity serves only to salvage words at the expense of reality. The parents of Dunbar students may or may not have been a random sample of the black parents of their time, either occupationally or in terms of their aspirations for their children. But neither were most of them people with professional careers or levels of income that would be considered middle class by the standards of American society as a whole. Intellectual or academic achievements for blacks, as for everyone else, no doubt have preconditions, but the crucial question is whether these are economic preconditions as so widely asserted, and so widely assumed to be insuperable barriers to good education for minority children from low-income families. A related stereotype is that the children who went to Dunbar High School were the light-skinned descendants of the black elite that derived from miscegenation during the era of slavery. Here again, the facts have been readily available and widely ignored. Photographs and old yearbooks from the era of Dunbar's academic success show no such preponderance of light-skinned blacks. Here again, there is a fundamental difference between saying that certain types of people were more likely to send their children to Dunbar, or that such children were overrepresented, and saying that most of the children who went to Dunbar came from such families. Whether in economic or other terms, the families from which the students of Dunbar High School came cannot be nearly so atypical as suggested by those who say that they were mostly Washington's growing black bourgeoisie. For many years, there was only one academic high school for blacks in the District of Columbia, and as late as 1948, one-third of all black youngsters attending high school in Washington attended Dunbar High School. If we took only the children of doctors and lawyers, a former Dunbar principal asked, how could we have had 1,400 black students at one time? 
this was not a selective school in the sense in which we normally use that term. It was not necessary to take tests to get in, for example, even though there was undoubtedly self-selection in the sense that students who were serious went to Dunbar, and those who were not had other places where they could while away their time without having to meet high academic standards. A spot check of attendance records and tardiness records showed that the M Street School at the turn of the century and Dunbar High School at mid-century had less absenteeism and less tardiness than the white high schools in the District of Columbia at those times. In the 19th century, tardiness had at first been a problem, but it was a problem that was apparently not tolerated. The school had a tradition of being serious, going back to its founders and early principals, who reflected the influence of the New England culture, which contrasted so much with that of the culture of most blacks. Among those early principals was the first black woman to receive a college degree in the United States, Mary Jane Patterson from Oberlin College, class of 1862. At that time, Oberlin had different academic curriculum requirements for women and men. Latin, Greek, and mathematics were required in the gentleman's course, as it was called, but not in the curriculum for ladies. Miss Patterson, however, insisted on taking Latin, Greek, and mathematics anyway. We can only imagine what fortitude and sense of purpose that must have taken at a time when no black woman had ever gotten a college degree in the entire history of the country, and when most members of her race were still slaves in the South. Not surprisingly, in her later 12 years as principal of the Black High School in Washington during its formative period, Mary Jane Patterson was noted for a strong, forceful personality, for thoroughness, and for being an indefatigable worker. Having this kind of person shaping the standards and traditions of the school in its early years undoubtedly had something to do with its later success. Other early principals included the first black man to graduate from Harvard, class of 1870. Three of the school's first ten principals had graduated from Oberlin, two from Harvard, and one each from Amherst and Dartmouth. Because of restricted academic opportunities for blacks, Dunbar could get teachers with very high qualifications, and even had PhDs among its teachers in the 1920s. Mary Gibson Hunley pointed out in her History of Dunbar High School, Federal standards providing equal salaries for all teachers, regardless of sex or race, attracted to Washington the best-trained colored college graduates from northern and western colleges in the early days, and later from local colleges as well. One of the other educational dogmas of our times is the notion that standardized tests do not predict future performances for minority children, either in academic institutions or in life. Innumerable scholarly studies have devastated this claim intellectually, though it still survives and flourishes politically. But the history of this black high school in Washington likewise shows a payoff for solid academic preparation and the test scores that result from it. Over the entire 85-year history of academic success in this school, from 1870 to 1955, most of its graduates went on to higher education. This was very unusual for either black or white high school graduates during that era. Because these were usually low-income students, most went to a local free teacher's college or to relatively inexpensive Howard University. But significant numbers won scholarships to leading colleges and universities elsewhere. Early in the 20th century, some M Street school graduates began going to Harvard, the first in 1903, and other academically elite colleges. A French educator who visited the M Street school that year described its students as pursuing the same studies as our average college student. During the period from 1918 to 1923, graduates of this school went on to earn 25 degrees from Ivy League colleges, Amherst, Williams, and Wellesley. At one time during this era, there were nine black students at Amherst, six from Dunbar High School. Over the period from 1892 to 1954, Amherst admitted 34 graduates of the M Street School and Dunbar. Of these, 74% graduated from Amherst and 28% of these graduates were Phi Beta Kappas. Nor was Amherst unique. Dunbar graduates also became Phi Beta Kappas at Harvard, Yale, Williams, Cornell, Dartmouth, and other elite institutions. At one time, the reputation of Dunbar graduates was such that they did not have to take entrance examinations to be admitted to Dartmouth, Harvard, and some other selective colleges. 
When Robert N. Mattingly graduated from the M Street School in 1902, he entered Amherst College, receiving credit for freshman mathematics and first-year college physics. And he graduated in three years, Phi Beta Kappa. Yet, far from being one of the elite, Mattingly was, in his own words, at Amherst on a shoestring. No systematic study has been made of the later careers of the graduates of M Street and Dunbar High School. However, when black educator Horace Mann Bond studied the backgrounds of blacks with PhDs in 1970, he discovered that more of them had graduated from M Street Dunbar than from any other black high school in the country. The first black who pioneered in a number of fields also came from this school. The first black man to graduate from Annapolis came from Dunbar. The first black enlisted man in the Army to rise to become a commissioned officer also came from this same institution. So did the first black woman to receive a Ph.D. from an American university. So did the first black full professor at a major American university, Allison Davis at the University of Chicago. So did the first black federal judge, the first black general, the first black cabinet member, the first black senator elected since Reconstruction, and, among other notables, the doctor who pioneered the use of blood plasma, historian Carter G. Woodson, author and poet Sterling Brown, and Duke Ellington, who studied music at Dunbar. During World War II, when black military officers were rare, there were among this school's graduates many captains and lieutenants, nearly a score of majors, nine colonels and lieutenant colonels, and one brigadier general. All this contradicts another widely believed notion— that schools do not make much difference in children's academic or career success because income and family background are much larger influences. If the schools do not differ very much from one another, then of course it will not make much difference which one a child attends. But when they differ dramatically, the results can also differ dramatically. This was not the only school to achieve success with minority children. But before turning to other examples, it may be useful to consider why and how this 85-year history of dramatic success was abruptly turned into all-too-typical failure, virtually overnight, by the politics of education. <laughs>